The Cosmic Highway. God's Word for Today and Beyond. Truths you might not have heard before. Truths that might be considered as fringe, controversial, blurry, or just unbelievable. This is the Unfiltered Biblical. Hello and welcome to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond. I am Dr. S.W. Kibler here at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries. Please remember to like and follow the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond. And thank you so much to those who support this ministry financially and through prayer. At the end of this video, there is a screen that provides information on how to support us. Hello and welcome to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond. I am Pastor Steve at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministry saying thank you for joining me for this installment of the video series, Eternity, From There and Back Again, God's Plan Through the Ages, A Super natural conflict. Well, I, I have this graphic that I want to, uh, again, make available to you so you can see this is where we have been and where we're going uh, from eternity there and back again. God's plan started before creation and in, in eternity, and it will end after uh, uh, Revelation and when uh, the Son hands uh, the kingdom over to God the Father, it'll wind back up in eternity. That's where we get our name. Notice that the entirety of everything that the Lord is doing with humanity from beginning to end is overarched and undergirded by the promise. And that's important for us, and we'll touch on that in today's video as well. These are the ages of God with humanity. And uh, I just wanted to make that graphic uh, available to you where you can see it. Uh, for your information, where we live today is this purple, purple font here. It's called the mystery. The mystery. Sometimes known as man under grace. Sometimes it's the age of grace. Sometimes the dispensation of grace. Sometimes the age of the church or the church age. But whatever you want to call it, it really was a mystery. And this is where we live today. And you can see that it intersects right here before what is known as the tribulation. <clears throat> uh, so I, once again, you can just see where we've been and where we're going. And this is ba all on, based on the entirety of the biblical text. And I want you to uh, at least have it so you can, can look at it and, and kind of a, a guide and do your own study as well. So I just want to very quickly recap the seven biblical feasts that were given to Israel and the sacrifices and offerings that the Lord specified. So here, once again, is this graphic. You can see on this side here are the spring feasts, and on this side here are the fall feasts. This is the Hebrew calendar and their months. And... Uh, you can tell Passover, uh, Nisan, uh, that has the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. That all falls into our calendar year of around uh, March, April. And then Pentecost falls around our, our year around May. And then we come down here to the fall feast here in Tishri. And that corresponds with our uh, September, sometimes October, for our September. So that's about where these months fall. You can see there's the Passover, uh, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, uh, Pentecost, uh, Rosh Hashanah, trumpets, Yom Kippur, atonement, and then Sukkot, uh, tabernacles or booths. And we review these feasts because they all point to Yeshua, Jesus Christ. As we looked we just did a series on the seven feasts and how they all point to the promise and how Yeshua, Jesus Christ, uh, fulfilled each of the feasts during his earthly ministry. Not only were they given by 
the pre-incarnate Yeshua, uh, Yahweh Elohim in the Old Testament. He implemented them. He's also the one who fulfilled them and their prophetic, uh, the prophetic uh, components of these feasts and also the sacrifices and offerings that needed to take place. So if you haven't yet looked at those videos, uh, there are two videos that go through these seven feasts, this seven feasts of biblical feasts of Israel, part one and part two. And then there are three other videos, four of the videos that go in a little bit more detail on some of the feasts and their application for us today that we need to understand. So the sacrifices and the offerings uh, of, that were under the law, they never granted permanent or complete forgiveness for sin. It was uh, only partial. And we're going to take a look at the five types of sacrifices very, very briefly. The the five uh, offerings that are given. And this is just uh, a design by R.K. Campbell, and I find it very helpful. Uh, during the feast, you will see that, uh, and also there were offerings that were brought uh, voluntarily uh, to the temple, to the priest, on behalf of individuals as well. There were, so there was uh, uh, the, the, the uh, burnt offering that all was burnt, but the skin was given to the priest. And uh, that was to uh, bring uh, a glory to God. It was given to God, and it was all burned up. And then there was the meal offering, which speaks of mankind and bringing what the Lord has provided to him, uh, provided to mankind. It was given back to the Lord as a, as a meal offering. There's a peace offering uh, that... Uh, entails fellowship with the Lord. Then there was the sin offering uh, and the guilt offering that was made. And these are these are sacrifices. One number one here the burnt offering, uh, peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering all required the death of an animal. Right? And we see that Christ fulfilled uh, all of these. That He uh, His complete death brought peace between man and God the forgiveness of sin, and uh, then the atonement uh, aspect of, of his uh, sacrifice on the cross, and then how we come with thanksgiving uh, back to the Lord. So this is just, I, like I said, I just wanted you to see these are the offerings and the sacrifices that were required to take place during uh, the seventh feast of, uh, biblical feast of Israel, but also... Uh, uh, some of them were brought volu voluntary uh, by individuals uh, for their for their own sake uh, to the Lord. So we just review these feasts and these sacrifices uh, because they all point to Yeshua, to Yah uh, Yahweh Elohim, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these were under the law. And what we need to realize is that there's an important connection between the law and promise in what, G, what Yeshua did and why he did it is connected to the law and the promise. And it's not connected to what we call the church. It's connected to what the Lord said he was already going to do. And it involves the children of Israel and it involves um, the law and the promise. So we're going to touch on that a little bit more in depth in just a minute. What we do want to uh, read about here in the Apostle Paul uh, wrote in Galatians that the law was to show the need for the promise and to lead those people under the law to the promise, the seed, who is the Savior, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Primarily, all of these offerings and sacrifices, because they were not permanent, in their capacity to forgive sin. It was just by the obedience of the individuals in their own heart before the Lord that there was a covering of the sin that was granted as long as they did what they were told to do with these, these offerings and these sacrifices. But it wasn't permanent. Permanent forgiveness of sin and eternal life only came through Yeshua, Jesus Christ, God himself, in the flesh, his death, burial, resurrection, 
and then his glorification, his ascension to heavens, only through him. But the feasts and the the uh, uh, offerings and the sacrifices were to show man's need for the promise, for the Savior. We read this in Galatians 3.24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So it's often difficult for today's Christians to understand that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, did not do away with the law. He did not do away with the law. He fulfilled the law. And there is a great difference between the two. He didn't do away with it. He just fulfilled it because it was prophetic about him and what he was going to do as Yeshua on earth. His birth presented as king, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection to life and his ascension to heaven was all prophesied in these feasts and also in the sacrifices and the offerings that were under the law. This age in which we live is not under the law. But as the Apostle Paul proclaims, it's the stewardship of God's grace, and it was a mystery hidden. So we're going to talk a little about, a bit about where we are today, the age that we live in today. Uh, so we're going to look at Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And we read this, Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Now, this word stewardship of God's grace, sometimes that's also translated as dispensation and also known as an age, age of God's grace. <clears throat> Just so you know. So how, this is verse 3. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is, the time that we live in now, here declared in Ephesians chapter 3, was not previously prophesied. It was inserted by the Lord. It was always part of his plan, which the Apostle Paul will make sure he includes here in just a minute in Ephesians. It was always part of the Lord's plan, but it was not prophesied, this age in which we live. Okay, And he says, uh, this mystery is that the Gentiles... Now, what is a Gentile? A Gentile is anyone who is not a descendant of Jacob, Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. All else, okay, Gentile is not from Jacob and from Judah, Judah, right? So it's me. I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish. I'm not from the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Gentiles refers to everyone else, including Arabs, and Chinese, Europeans, Americans, everyone who's not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and then through Jacob. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the good news. Of this good news I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the ecclesia, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So the ecclesia is the congregation. It's translated as church, but that's not a very good word, as I have covered it in other videos. Ecclesia means congregation or assembly. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made, now, made known now to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. It's not speaking about earthly rulers or authorities. It's talking about spiritual rulers and authorities. Specifically, um, I would say those 
uh, spiritual entities who are opposed to the Lord God. Okay. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have the boldness uh, and access with confidence through our faith in him. So, it was always part of the eternal purpose of the Lord for this, this age to come about. But it wasn't made known until after the close of the history of the book of Acts. It's when the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians was written was after the close, closing of the history of the book of Acts. So that's when this age came into being. That's when it was revealed to Paul and the other apostles and the prophets during that time. It's kind of important for us to realize this age uh, in which we live, this age of mystery or of God's great grace. This age will end. It doesn't endure forever. It ends. It has a definite beginning point and an ending point. It began after the closure of the closure of the history in the in the book of Acts, chapter twenty eight, and it ends with a definite event that we know as the harpazo or the catching up, snatching away, also referred to as the rapture. It has a definite uh, period of existence. The law was in force and in effect before this age, and when this age culminates, or when it finishes, the law will be reinstituted again. Mosaic law before, Mosaic law after. Okay, We know this is true because that's what the biblical text tells us. <laughs> How much clearer can you be when the biblical text says, hey, this is the way it's going to be. Right now, you're not under law, you're under grace, but as soon as this time, this age is removed, the law is re-implemented. That's why we need to realize that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, did not abolish the law. He did not do away with the law. He fulfilled the law because it was to lead people to him. Okay? So now we have this age in which we live, this age of mystery. But when this age ends, the law will be re-implemented. And we read that in Deuteronomy Chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. And this is speaking of eschatological events, the end times, uh, when Israel is regathered. Right? When Israel is regathered and re-implemented as a nation. The nation Israel now is not the prophetic nation of Israel. This is a, a man-made uh, geopolitical uh, state uh, that is on some of the land that was promised to uh, Abram and his descendants, and specifically to the seed that is Yeshua himself. <clears throat> but when the Lord regathers and then implements the fullness of the borders. So we're looking at end times. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Okay, so here we go. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 8. And when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. For... If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heavens, then the Lord will gather you from there. He will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. It's very clear, very evident that the Lord is speaking here to a specific group of people, isn't it? The children of Israel, those who come to uh, a believe in him and faith in him. Those descendants. Not all descendants, but those who believe in him. Right? 
those of the descendants of Jacob, of Israel. So it's very specific who's being spoken of here, the nation Israel that the Lord will gather together and that he will circumcise their heart. We read this other places, that he will put his law in their, in their heart. We're not under the law now. So that's not speaking to us. It's speaking to a future generation where the law will be put uh, in their heart. So the Lord will circumcise your heart uh, in the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecute you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. So this is Moses, the Lord, speaking through Moses. And we look at the law of Moses and all of the commandments that the Lord had given to the people through Moses. This is Deuteronomy. And this is a regiving of the law. Verse 8, here, uh, verse 8 of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy tells us that in that future time, still yet to come from our point now, it's still future from here. But when he regathers them, that the law will be re-implemented and that they will keep all his commandments that he had commanded up to this point uh, in Deuteronomy, up to this day. So that includes all of the law of Moses. It will be re-implemented, and they will keep all the commandments. So it's very clear that the law will be re-implemented after this age in which we live is concluded. This is also why we read in the, the, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, that in the end times, still future for us today, uh, will be an end to the sacrifices and offerings. So, how can sacrifices and offerings be ended if they're not restarted? When we know that uh, Daniel chapter 9, when it's saying this, is looking to the future at what is called the Great Tribulation. So, it's still future from us, but in the tribulation, what we know as a tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, that the offerings and sacrifices will be stopped. They can't be stopped if they are not restarted again, right? So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put it into sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint the a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build uh, Jerusalem to the coming of the of an anointed one, a prince, there will be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with square and moat, but in troubled times. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off. So there's seven weeks left now. Uh, that's still going to be future. We're in between. Uh, we're in between the week seventy-nine and the seventieth week in this prophet. This is where our age fits in to God's timing. We sit in between the sixty-ninth week of the prophet uh, prophecy here in Daniel nine and the seventieth week, that one week, which is known as the Great Tribulation. Okay. So after the sixty-two weeks, the Anointed One will be cut off. Yeshua was cut off. He was rejected by Israel. And now this mystery has been put in place that we live in this time, this piece of God's grace, this age of God's grace. When it ends, the seventh week begins. That's prophesied here. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with the many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So he'll make a, a covenant, a, a peace treaty, so uh, for seven years, but halfway in, after three and a half years, after a week and a half, so three and a half years, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. So if there's an end to put the sacrifice and offering, that means it has to start 
somewhere. So it has to start at the beginning of the seven-year covenant, at least, right? At least it has to start there, if not before. But after three and a half years into this, this seven-year covenant, uh, it, the covenant is broken, and this, uh, this one to come, who's also known as the Antichrist, will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the end, <clears throat> on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So, we're looking at our time frame fitting in between the 69th and the 70th week, the 70th week being the seven-year tribulation period. So, when this age in which we live comes to a conclusion, is removed, then this 70 week takes over. And we see that there's offerings and sacrifices, which again is not, uh, more evidence that the law will be re-implemented after this age in which we live. Okay. Um, the book of Acts does not record the beginning of the ecclesia. I've covered that in other videos. I don't want to go into depth here. It's not the beginning of the church, what we know of the church, ecclesia. And even that word uh, church is a really a bad translation. It's a, it's, a, it's a wrong translation. It's a wrong word to use to translate ecclesia, which means ecclesia in the Greek means congregation and assembly. So it's those assembly or congregation of, of the Lord. That's who it's speaking about, the people. Um, and that's important for us to understand. Uh, because we think too highly of what we call the church. And where we are today was not so important because it wasn't even included in prophecy. right? It's part of the Lord's plan, but it wasn't prophesied that it was going to happen. And so, it, it, it's just kind of where we are. And uh, we talked about the Feast of Shavuot that's recorded in the book of Acts. And that was about the giving of the law and how Yeshua was the completion of the law. Just read the preachings of, of Peter in the first couple of chapters, first three chapters, and it becomes very evident of what is taking place. But what we have to understand is that is the concept of ecclesia, which is the word in the Greek used in the New Testament that's translated as church. But the ecclesia did not begin in the New Testament. The ecclesia is a continuation of what was started from the very beginning that's recorded in the Old Testament. It's the congregation or the, the assembly of the people of the Lord. That's important for us to realize, to understand. The ecclesia has existed, even in the, the, the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, um, the Septuagint. They use the Greek word ecclesia to translate the Hebrew word for assembly and congregation. It's very evident of what is being spoken of. It's not something that just occurred in the New Testament, right? It's, uh, it has been since there was one person who believed God. One person who believed God in the promise, about the promise, they become the first person to be a member of the ecclesia, of the congregation, of the assembly, of God. And it has built since then. We're talking about from the very beginning, the very first person who ever believed God, believed in God. Okay? Um, it might have been Adam. I don't know. But the very first one who believed in God and placed their faith in him concerning the promise. That's the beginning of the ecclesia. There is so much talk today in Christendom about the end of the world. Especially after this latest event of the uh, uh, solar eclipse. And how many even Christian preachers were saying this could be a sign from the Lord. Well, it, it, it was a sign that the Lord has placed the stars and the planets, the sun and the moon, into a fixed path that can be predicted mathematically when these events are going to take place. It shows God is precise. 
and he placed the patterns of the movement of the stars, the constellations, the sun and the moon and the earth and the planets. He put them in their orbits and in their paths. It does declare the awesomeness of God, but it's not declaring his judgment or end times. But there's always talk about the end times, right? Uh, the end of the world. Uh, people watching for the rapture. And most today, we hear about the rapture of the church. Well, once again, we have to go back to Ecclesia. It's about those who belong to the Lord, those who believe in God and place their faith in him concerning the promised one, the one who would smash Satan on the head, namely Yeshua. So it's the rapture, that we call it the rapture, harpazo, snatching away, catching up, is not only for the new, what we call the New Testament church. Because the idea of the harpazo is found in the Old Testament concerning Israel, concerning those children of Israel who believe in God and the promise. Okay, so that's important for us to realize. We're going to look here in about, and we're going to look at this harpazo, this idea of the the the, the rapture, and we're going to look in Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, verses one through twelve. It says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit. See, there are spirits who will not tell the truth. So just because there's something that's spiritual doesn't mean that it's of the Lord. Either by a spirit or a spoken word. Matter of fact, there are a lot of people today who claim to be Christians that are getting, and preachers, who are getting messages from spirits. They claim they're getting messages from spirits. They call them angels. Let me tell you what. You need to be careful. Either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. This is the one who's referred to in the prophecy of Daniel, right, who <clears throat> uh, uh, breaks that covenant after three and a half years. He's also known to us the term called the Antichrist this world leader. This is who's being spoken of here. The man of lawlessness until he's revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against ever so, every so-called God or object of worship. He elevates himself to be God. That's important. He elevates himself to be God. Even so, he takes the seat in the temple of God proclaiming to be God himself. So he proclaims to be God. Friends, listen, that can happen today. This opponent, this opponent can be giving messages as though it is from God because he will exalt himself and claim to be God. Now, God is just a title. It's not, it's not a personal name of Yahweh Elohim, the Most High God, the Creator God. But he will proclaim himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed at his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So here's what the biblical text is telling us now, is the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, so we need to be diligent and pray for discernment because the mystery of lawlessness is already out there. The one behind it has not yet been revealed. This antichrist is worldly, is not revealed yet, and he won't come into play until the Lord allows him. We need to realize that the appearing of the lawless one, the appearing of this one we call the Antichrist, will only take place when the Lord allows it because the Lord God is in control. And the revealing of this 
lawless one is part <coughs> excuse me of God's plan. It's all part of God's plan. It's good news because God's word is going to be fulfilled. And then the lawlessness will lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Listen, we're moving into a time when there is a prevalence of signs and wonders uh, taking place within what's called Christendom. And we need to heed a warning from Scripture that the signs and wonders most likely are going to be false because there's no prophecy about God's sign and wonders during this time. The signs and wonders that are going to take place next from the Lord, as far as I can read the biblical text, happen during the time of the tribulation. And those signs and wonders are terrible. They're terrible. They're terrifying. So we need to be careful. We need to be diligent. We need to know the truth and stand on the truth and not be deceived. Here's why. It says, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse the love of the truth and, and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false. Friends, we are talking about those who are religious. There will be a delusion. They will believe... Listen, they will believe that these signs and wonders are from Yahweh Elohim when, in fact, they are not. They are from his adversary, Satan himself. The activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. See, this is why we look at this eternity from eternity, right? God's plan through the ages, a supernatural conflict. Because there is a supernatural conflict that's taking place today in our very existence. And part of that supernatural conflict is that the enemy falsifies signs and wonders. You need to be discerning. Who is causing these signs and wonders to take place? It's very imperative. We are living in this time when these delusions are beginning to take place. It's evident. Just look at the state of Christianity compared to what God's word says to what now is being accepted into churches that call themselves Christian. It says, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth. They hold on to ritual, tradition, instead of truth, and they bring in from the world to make acceptable what God, the Lord God, says is abominable, and they call it worship, and they call it Christianity. It is a strong delusion that we need to be prepared to recognize infiltrating the church. The reason in order that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, i.e. died. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have died in the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and are left, believers, in Yeshua, in the promise, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we all will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another 
with these words. Now we're going to add another verse to this out of the Gospel of John. And this is John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be, and you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I mentioned before, it's a common uh, assumption by many Christians, Bible teachers, preachers, and so forth, that this, this reality, this concept of the harpazo, the catching up, the snatching away, also known as the rapture, and the dwelling places in heaven are for, uh, dwelling places in heaven are for believers in a New Testament concept, but they are not. It's not about the New Testament concept. It's not about the New Testament, what we call the New Testament church. This is Old Testament, and it was revealed to those who were under the law. This is important for us to realize that this idea, this reality of the harpazo in dwelling with the Lord uh, is Old Testament. Because the ecclesia, the congregation, the assembly of the Lord, is not New Testament only. We are grafted in. We are brought into it. But it began long, long ago. So we read clearly. We're going to go to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 26, verses 19 through 21. And in this section of the prophet Isaiah, the Lord is revealing to him things in the future, what we call eschatology, looking at the future, what we call end times. Okay, Still future to us. It was future when it was given uh, to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, and it's still future to us today who live in this age, uh, today, this age of mystery or the stewardship of God's grace. It's still future from us. It's end times. But here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 through 21. Your dead shall live. What did we just read in 1 Thessalonians? The dead in Christ will rise first. Right? It says, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Come, my people, enter your chambers, your dwelling places. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. And then the next verse is chapter in order, here is number uh, chapter 27, verse 1. It says, in that day, so your dead will rise, they'll be resurrected. You're to go to your dwelling place, your chamber, for a while until the fury of the Lord passes because the Lord is coming to pass judgment on the iniquity of the inhabitants of earth. That's speaking of the tribulation. In that day, chapter 27, verse 1, in that day the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Wow! These verses here in the prophet Isaiah clearly show that the Lord had promised his people safety and protection from his wrath during the great tribulation. This is not New Testament. This is contained in the Old Testament. It's always been part of God's plan. It's not about the church. It's about God's plan through the ages. From eternity to eternity, 
God's plan through the ages and it's based in his promise. And that promise is Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Okay? Listen, his people are raised to life. Your dead shall live, their body shall rise. That's speaking of the resurrection. Resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> they will enter the dwelling places. Same thing that the Lord said in John chapter 14, right? It says, come now, my people, enter your chambers. They will be spared from the wrath of the Lord. It says, hide yourself for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. <clears throat> and the earth will disclose the bloodshed on it and will no more be covered, uh, cover its slain. And also, Satan and his cohorts will be defeated. In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Wow. You see here, this concept of a harpazo, listen, important, here in the Old Testament, to the people under the law, this promise was given that at a future time, if they believe in God and in the promise, if they are his, they will be resurrected and caught up to dwelling places. Exactly what Yeshua said in the Gospel of John chapter 14. Exactly what the Apostle Paul was writing in 1 Thessalonians. It's exactly the same thing. And it is pre-tribulation. Huh, that's so important. Because they are caught up and put in their dwelling places for a little while because the Lord is coming, right? They're, they're placed in the dwelling places for a little while until after the fury of the Lord because the Lord is coming to judge the iniquity, right? To bring his wrath on the iniquity of humanity on the earth. That is a pre-tribulation harpazo catching up of the people of God that includes, includes believers of the Old Testament times. It's what the biblical text says. Friends, this is phenomenal. This is God's plan through the ages. This is why I believe the promise perspective concerning the biblical text is so imperative. We, we are included in the promises made to Abraham, made to Adam, made to Eve, made to Isaac, Jacob, his descendants. Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the promise. He is the promise. He is the one who will crush the serpent on the head. He's the one who is referred to here. In Isaiah uh, 26, he's the one referred to throughout Scripture. He is the promise. The Lord made the promise. We read this in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You see, what's sometimes missed here is... The Lord is speaking to Satan. He's making a promise to Satan. <laughs> the Lord is going to keep the promise he made to the serpent who deceived man. Man sinned, lost his standing with God, and now sin has plagued the world. But the Lord is promising the serpent, Satan, who we know now. He says, I'm going to do this. The Lord keeps his word even to his enemies. Thought I'd share that. But it's Yeshua, Jesus Christ, who is the promise. He's the promise made in the garden. He's the promise made to <laughs> the serpent. He's the one who's going to smash the serpent's head. Yeshua is a promise made to Abraham and carried on by his descendants. And this is Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. 
Who? Who is the great reward? It wasn't possessions. It wasn't the land. No. The Lord came to Abraham and said, I am your shield and I am your great reward. And then it says, and Abram believed in the Lord. And it was counted to him as righteousness. <clears throat> and then further on in uh, chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 18, it says, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring I give this land from the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, uh, uh, Perizzites, uh, Raphaim, uh, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Who? Who's the offspring? Well, oh, here, this is Isaiah 26. I, I missed that slide. This is Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. You can read it for yourself. I'll leave it here for just a minute. If you want, you can pause the video and you can read it. Okay, here we go. The Law and the Promise, Galatians 5, uh, 3, 15 through 16. This is the Apostle Paul writing. To give a human example, brothers, even when a man-made covenant, no one, with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abram and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, that is plural, referring to many, but referring to one. Offspring refers to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. There we go. The offspring referred to in the promise is none other than the Lord himself. Yeshua, Mashiach, right? Jesus, the Christ. He is the promise. Therefore, anything that we have today in Yeshua is by virtue of the promise made years and years and years and years previous, starting in the Garden of Eden carried on to Abram because the promise is actually Yeshua, Jesus Christ. That's why we looked at the seven biblical covenants. We looked at the sacrifice and the offerings because they all point to Jesus. They all point to Yeshua. They were prophetically fulfilled by Yeshua. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it. We need to realize and grasp that our hope is not in someone or something new, and it's not in the church. It's in nothing else other than Yahweh Elohim himself, the Lord God himself, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. That's who our hope is in, in only him. It's, he's the promise. He's not just the promised one. He is the promise. both to the Jew and to the Gentile. And it was he who promised to the Jew in the Old Testament that they would be raised from the dead and caught up to the dwelling places to be safe from the judgment of Yahweh during the Great Tribulation. And it was to them that the Savior and Messiah was promised. And today, we are taught how blind the Jews were and how they were caught up in their legalism and caught up in their religion and caught up in their rituals and caught up in their uh, traditions of the law but we need to realize that today christendom today is in the same shape and doing exactly the same things that we condemn the jews of doing of missing the truth because we worship often the church. We elevate what we call the church and its rituals and its traditions and even its legalism. And when we do that, we miss the truth of the biblical text because we start interpreting the biblical text according to our rituals and our traditions and our own legalism instead of taking the biblical text 
at word for word, point for point for what it says. We need to take God's word to heart and realize that the church today, Christianity today, this age is failing and it will fail. There is no church triumphant. There is a church that fails because it has told us this in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And to the angel of the ecclesia in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor uh, cold nor hot. Would you that you were either cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is the Lord speaking about now, it's commonly understood that the letter to the church of Laodicea, Laodicea is called the church of the last days or end times, where we live today, to us today. So because you today are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you, today, where we live today, Christendom today, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me, from the Lord, gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent today. This is for us today. This is how we need to see Christendom today, through the eyes of God and his word. This is what he sees of us today. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the ecclesias. The Lord is on the outside of Christendom today. That's what the biblical text we just read in Revelation tells us. The Lord Jesus Christ is on the outside knocking on the door trying to get our attention. Are we going to listen? Do we have an ear? Are we going to hear what the Lord is saying to us? Thank you for joining me for this, this uh, video. And I want to remind you this. Always know the truth. Always stand on the truth. And always speak the truth. God bless you.